Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the, to the webinar series. Today we have uh, the webinar number 44, and uh, it will deal on uh, clustering free energy landscape from molecular dynamic simulation. The speaker are Lucy Delemotte and Annie Westerlund. I'm hosting it together with uh, Julian Singh from University of Edinburgh. So the speaker of today is uh, R2. We have exactly two speakers. Julie Delemotte is professor in biophysics at uh, the Royal Institute of Technology. And she moved here in 2016 after a postdoc in a Temple University in Philadelphia and, and in Lausanne in Switzerland. Her main research focus is allosteric regulation and uh, as well as development of protocol to describe phenomena in quantitative matter. Annie has a background in, in uh, mathematical engineering and she's very interested in complex adaptive system. She joined the group of Lucy in 2016 where she started her PhD. She's interested in developing apply data analysis method and she your her aim is to understand how protein conformational dynamics works together with ion channel gating allosteric path now i will give the word to start the webinar too uh thank you alessandra for the very nice introduction and uh it's a uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to discuss how we can use clustering to make sense of molecular dynamic simulations. So I would like to thank uh, BioXL for this opportunity. So um, we have a fantastic tool with molecular dynamic simulations because they allow us to look at the evolution of dynamical systems a long time at a very fine resolution, uh, both uh, time-wise and in space. Unfortunately, uh, they can be quite difficult to interpret because of the noisiness, as you can see on this movie of uh, calmodulin, a calcium sensitive protein. And uh, we will explore in this webinar how we can use clustering to make sense of this noisy data and uh, to uncover some mechanistic insights about our proteins of interest or biomolecules in general. So before I start, I just want to give a little bit of background in the vocabulary, the words that we will use in this presentation, and stress that uh, when we'll be talking about configurations, we mean uh, the arrangement of ad atoms in three dimensions. Uh, and uh, when we talk about states instead, we are talking about collections of similar configurations. So in this simple picture that you can see to the right of the screen, uh, if ligands are represented by these gray squares and the receptor is represented in green, you can see that these different configurations are uh, distributed into two states. The uh, blue state here is when a ligand is bound to the receptor and the unbound state here in green is when there is no ligand bound to the receptor. And if this is the entire landscape of configurations that can be explored by the system, then uh, we can get the probabilities of the states and say that the unbound state is twice as likely than the bound state, which uh, enables us to calculate the free energy of, or the relative free energy of these states according to the Boltzmann distribution. If we do this calculation of the probability and the free energy along a specific degree of freedom that is of interest for a system, that could also be called an order parameter or a collective variable, then we can uh, recover a so-called free energy landscape, as you can see here in yellow. Um, and the minima in this free energy landscape will be metastable states, or we will use here the word core states to describe a similar concept. Well, the states that will be localized on the free energy barrier will be called transition states. So now that we've decided uh, how, what we define as states, uh, I want to talk a little bit about clustering. Clustering 
and data analysis is assigning unlabeled data to groups. And if we extend this definition to our field in statistical physics, clustering is basically choosing the definition of state. And when we do clustering, this hinges on measuring similarity or dissimilarity between configurations. And we can do this basically in two ways, uh, in a structural manner or in a kinetic manner. And that would be measuring uh, configurations that are close to one another in time. In this webinar, we will not talk about kinetic uh, clustering and instead we will focus on structural clustering. So then uh, measuring similarity can be done by considering uh, the similarity in terms of Cartesian coordinates, which might seem like it's the uh, most straightforward choice. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's often dependent on the type of alignment that we use and uh, choosing an alignment is not trivial in the general case. It can be based on internal coordinates, which is more robust to, or is actually uh, rototranslationally invariant. And those could be interatomic distances or dihedrals or similar. And then we can also measure similarity in a reduced dimensionality. So along collective variables, as I was describing in the previous, uh, in the previous slide. This uh, is what is usually done in practice because uh, doing clustering in the high dimensional space becomes usually impractical with a, a high number uh, of, uh, or you need a large number of configurations to then be able to cluster and that becomes impractical. So most of the methods that I will describe today will be based on measuring similarity using collective variables and I will mention when this is not the case. So now I want to discuss how the clustering is actually done in practice. So this talk will be uh, divided into two parts. I'll start by describing seven clustering methods that are available out there. And for each method, describe the principle, the algorithm, and list the free parameters that need to be picked and describe how they can be picked in an advantageous manner. And in a second part, I will hand over to Annie Westerlund, who will describe a new clustering method that uh, she invented um, that is called inflection score, inflection core states or inflex. And she will provide you with a comparison between the seven methods that I will have described and her method on toy models for which we know the ground truth. And then finally, she'll show you a short tutorial to uh, show you how we apply inflex to a Calmodulin data set. So let's uh, dive in. The first method I want to mention is k-means, which is probably the most popular clustering algorithm that is out there. And uh, k-means uh, is basically a, a four-step algorithm. We'll initiate a number of centers at random, uh, k being the number of centers. So in the example that I'm showing here, we'll have three centers initiated at random. And then we'll create the k clusters by assigning the points to the nearest mean. So measuring the distance between each point to the mean and saying this one is the closest, so it belongs to the blue cluster. These ones are closer to the orange ones, so they belong to the orange cluster. With this, we move the mean to the centroid of the cluster and just repeat this step until convergence. So you can see, for example, here at this step, this point uh, that was originally in the orange cluster was actually closer to the yellow center. And so it became labeled as uh, yellow. And then the centroid of the yellow cluster moved uh, to uh, the center between these two points. So k-means, as you uh, can imagine, is a stochastic method, which means that you don't get twice the same result if you uh, carry out the clustering several times. And this is because the means are initiated at random. And by design, it works very well for spherical clusters, but doesn't perform well on data sets that have a different shape. Uh, in terms of parameters, what's quite nice about k-means is that there is only one parameter to pick, and that is the number of clusters k. And we can pick that uh, by using the silhouette score. So I'm highlighting here the clustering that might result from a number of centers three or a number of centers four. And you can see immediately that uh, having four clusters appears to be better in this case because it clusters the, the data in a more um, intuitive way. And in fact, the silhouette score, which is a, a small within cluster distance and a large distance to closest cluster, would be uh, high for this data set, whereas it would be low here because you can see that you instead have 
a large within cluster distance and a small distance between clusters. So you can use the silhouette score to determine that in that case, um, a partitioning into four states is better than a partitioning in three states, and this can be used for generic data sets. Now I want to talk about the second method, which is also very popular. It's called hierarchical clustering. And hierarchical clustering can be done in two ways. It can be divisive or agglomerative. And uh, in this presentation, I'll focus on the principle of agglomerative clustering. The idea of this method is to compute the similarity between every pair of objects in the data and cluster hierarchically um, to, uh, by grouping similar objects using linkage functions. So on this example data set, if you measure the distance between all points to all points, you'll see that the closest distance is between points A and D and F and G. So these get clustered uh, together initially. And then uh, continuing that way, we see that B is closer to AD and E is closer to FG. So they get clustered in a second step. And you keep going on until you can construct the entire tree, uh, which is also called a dendrogram. Uh, in terms of parameters to pick from, there are a few here. The first is you need to pick which linkage function you want to use. You could measure the distance between closest um, members of the cluster, between furthest, between average or centroid, or Ward's method consists in uh, minimizing the variance within the clusters. And then, as in the previous case, the number of clusters need to be determined. And here we can also use the silhouette score, uh, as was described in the previous case. And now I'm going to describe the last of the geometric methods, uh, spectral clustering. This method is uh, quite powerful and has gained traction um, over the years. And uh, it's a method that comes from graph theory. It uh, basically uh, hinges on building an undirected connectivity graph, representing the data as an adjacency matrix and building the graph Laplacian by subtracting this adjacency matrix from the degree matrix, which contains on the diagonal the total number of points a single point is connected to. Once you have the graph Laplacian, you can diagonalize it and find eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, and then cluster the top eigenvectors using k-means. So this method basically is applying k-means on a data set that has been pre-processed to take into account neighboring points. And this means that contrary to regular k-means, it allows to consider clusters that are not only spherical, but, uh, but of other shapes. Um, the number of clusters here can be picked in principle quite easily because the, uh, the spectrum of eigenvalues uh, should have some steps at the points where the partitioning of space is optimal. So in that case, you can see a jump at four eigenvalue at eigenvalue number four, which means that the optimal partitioning of space is in uh, four clusters. The problem might be that in uh, a real data set case, you might not see such clear uh, gaps in the uh, in the spectrum of eigenvalues, and uh, that uh, that might make it quite difficult to pick the optimal number of clusters. Other two issues with this method are how to build the connectivity graph. So basically how to determine whether there should be a link between two points. This is usually based on the distance uh, between points that is then sparsified to build the connectivity graph. But how you do the sparsification uh, means that you there, there is a decision to be made at which point you consider points that are close to actually be connected or not. And uh, that uh, needs to be determined and it's not straightforward always how to do. And then finally, different versions of the Laplacian matrix can be used, which is another parameter to, to pick. Now, the spectral clustering that, as I mentioned, became quite popular. And that is also because uh, spectral clustering, contrary to the other methods I mentioned, can be performed directly in the high dimensional space. Because in fact, when you are uh, diagonalizing the Laplacian, you're, you are doing a dimensionality reduction step which would be similar to uh, picking the collective variables along which you want to do your clustering. So that makes it a uh, quite powerful uh, technique that you don't have to pick the collective variables beforehand. 
So these three methods are really widely used in data science to cluster, uh, to per perform clustering, but we're really not taking advantage of the type of data that we are considering when we want to use molecular dynamic simulations. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, biomolecular behavior is easily understood in terms of free energy landscapes, which are essentially probability densities. So it might be nice to use uh, clustering methods that are based on uh, densities. And before I describe the methods, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, first step before doing clustering uh, with this kind of method means that we can do density estimation. And many of you might have done this and usually used histogramming without realizing that there were assumptions made when building histograms. And in fact, there are better methods to do density estimation that consider continuous basis functions like Gaussians and uh, global estimation. So this is a fascinating topic, but I don't have time to go into this, unfortunately. And uh, you can go to Annie's first paper uh, for a review of this and a proposal on how to use Gaussian mixture models in an advantageous way to do density estimation. But I am mentioning this because it is the first step of uh, clustering using density-based methods um, that you need to pick a way to estimate the density. So the first of the density-based methods I'm going to talk about is hierarchical DB scan, which builds on traditional DB scans. And DB scan is a method that uh, defines core points as having at least n neighbors within a cutoff epsilon. So on this example, for example, uh, you can see that this point within a cutoff epsilon has no neighbors, this point has one, whereas this point has two. So if you choose the number of nearest neighbors uh, to be two, in this case, you would have four core points. Then you connect the points if they belong to each other's neighborhoods, which is the case for these three, so they become uh, part of the, the same cluster and then you assign any point that is part of one of the core points neighborhood to the same cluster, uh, which uh, then yields, in this case, two clusters and two outliers. As you can imagine, uh, the parameter epsilon that you use to do this is uh, quite crucial. So here we have extended epsilon to epsilon prime, and you can see that now all the points are considered core states and they all now belong to a single cluster. And so hierarchical DB scan basically uh, builds on DB scan by varying epsilon and building the corresponding uh, dendrogram or tree, and then extract the clusters through local cuts. Unfortunately, this method has quite a few parameters to pick from, and uh, this will be difficult or impossible to review in this presentation. So if you're interested in the method, I refer you to the documentation. Um, two methods I will go through very quickly that have gained traction in our field, also because they were designed by uh, statistical physicists that are from our community. The first is density peaks, which comes from the group of uh, Alessandro Lyo. Um, this is a clever method that uh, hinges on calculating the local density rho, calculating the minimum distance to any other point with higher density, and then plotting this decision graph in which um, the outliers uh, here with a high density and a high distance will be the centers of clusters. Uh, this uh, is a quite clever method, but unfortunately this decision graph uh, is difficult to interpret in the general case. You sometimes are not able to decide which points look like they are sticking out. And so there's an advanced version of density peaks um, that attempts to automatically um, figure out the topology of the landscape and pick uh, peaks directly. There's a, uh, another method uh, that was designed by the group of uh, Garrett Stock, um, and that is called robust density clustering. That is quite interesting for us to use because it's intuitive, and uh, basically it does an estimation of the density by counting the number of points within a radius R, and then joining the points within a free energy cutoff uh, and closer than D lump, and the free energy cutoff is increased iteratively until you can build the structure of the clusters in a hierarchical way. And as I mentioned, this, this method is, uh, is, takes advantage of the shape of the free energy landscape, which is nice. Uh, unfortunately, though, it has quite a few parameters to fit, 
and uh, the authors uh, have um, in their papers a description on how to pick uh, these parameters in the best way possible. So this brings me to the, the last uh, density-based method that I want to describe and the last also clustering method that I, I will uh, talk about briefly, and that is uh, Gaussian mixture models. It's uh, based on this, the, the method to estimate density that has the same name. And in this method, basically, we fit the points to a number of Gaussian co components using a maximum likelihood approach. Um, the algorithm that is used to do this is uh, expectation maximization, and this allow us, allows us to find the parameters of the Gaussian mixture, the amplitudes, the means, uh, the, the means mu that mark the positions, um, and the uh, covariance which uh, measures the shape or which um, uh, parameterizes the shape of the, of the Gaussian. Um, and, uh, and based on this, then we can assign the point to the Gaussian component it's most likely to have been sampled from. This method is very nice because it's uh, robust and uh, you, there's only one parameter to pick, the number of clusters, which is also the number of components, and we can avoid overfitting by uh, calculating uh, either by using a cross-validation scheme or the Bayesian information criterion, in which case uh, the only parameters that we need to pick is the minimum and maximum number of components that we want to try out uh, to uh, then pick using these schemes. So this is very nice, but unfortunately it, uh, it assumes that the data is Gaussian distributed. And so I'm gonna hand over to Annie now and she will describe how she extended this framework of Gaussian mixture models uh, and devised a new clustering scheme that uh, is particularly well suited for um, data that comes from molecular dynamics simulations. Okay, uh, thank you, Lucy. Uh, so yes, um, as we've talked about a few times now, uh, we're interested in how to cluster molecular dynamics data. And basically, these simulations are noisy, so we would like to somehow identify well-defined core states uh, and then leave the transition points uh, outside of these definitions. Uh, and these uh, core states should be located at the free energy minimum. Um, so uh, what Inflex does is uh, it uses the shape of the density to do this. Uh, and specifically, uh, the first step is to compute uh, the second derivative of the density landscape. Uh, so if we show the second derivative as a color uh, in this uh, free energy landscape, we see that um, the second derivative of the density is negative where we have a free energy minimum. So this way we can uh, label uh, the the points as being either a core state point or a transition point. Uh, and when we've done this, we can see that uh, we will have these kind of islands of core state points uh, that belong to the same free energy minimum. Um, that, and these islands are separated by uh, transition points. So uh, to, uh, to be able to extract the core states, we need to uh, sort of join together the points that are in the same uh, free energy minimum. Uh, and we do this by allowing connections, uh, connecting points uh, within the same, um, uh, uh, that two core state points are connected if they don't have a transition point between them. So for example, here we don't allow a connection. Uh, and this will then lead us uh, to these two uh, subgraphs uh, which we also call uh, connected components. Uh, and then we label each connected component and assign this label to all the points um, that belong to these uh, connected components. Uh, and this uh, gives us the uh, core states that we were looking for. Uh, and what's kind of nice about this uh, clustering is that because we rely on uh, a Gaussian mixture density, uh, we use the functional definition uh, and basically, that means that we can extract the regions of core states um, not using the data itself, but we can use, for example, a grid um, to do this. 
So that would mean that we had equidistantly spaced points, uh, regardless if we have a core state or a transition state. So uh, this would make it a little bit more robust, but still in the, um, in the most basic case, um, we use the data itself. Uh, yes, so to, um, to then uh, go further, we wish to evaluate um, the clustering of, uh, of this method um, with respect to the other seven methods that Lucy went through. Uh, and as she mentioned, uh, we're using toy models. So we have three toy models uh, that we're testing these uh, methods on. Uh, and basically a toy model um, is a model that is a, it's a fake data set. So we know the ground truth. Um, but what we're going to do is that we're going to pretend that we don't know the ground truth. And then we're going to um, apply each of these methods uh, to the data sets. Um, and uh, try to let the data uh, give us um, uh, give us the clusters. So, for example, for k-means, um, we will use a silhouette score, uh, and we will use the same uh, for agglomerative uh, clustering with the ward criterion to select the number of uh, clusters. For spectral clustering, we will instead use the eigengap score. Uh, and in general, I'm going uh, just going to mention that we're using sort of recommended uh, settings and default settings. So we're not uh, optimizing these methods on the data. Um, <clears throat> and this goes for all of these methods. So we're using, um, uh, we're just trying to see how well we can do this if we don't know anything about the structure of the data. Uh, for DMM and Inflex, uh, we will use the big score uh, to uh, decide on the number of Gaussian components. Uh, and since uh, we're evaluating the full clustering, uh, this means that we also want to assign cluster labels to transition points. So for inflex, this means that um, we are sorting the transition points uh, in order of uh, decreasing density, and then we're assigning them one by one uh, to the closest uh, labeled points. So this will effectively uh, fill up the free energy well from uh, the minimum up to um, the transition um, barriers. Okay, so um, we want to quantitatively um, describe how well these methods perform. So we use um, a scoring function uh, or a metric called V-measure, uh, which uh, basically um, it's a number between zero and one, and it measures how well the points from one true class uh, are clustered together while not being merged together with points from other classes. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, we have three toy models, uh, and for each toy model, we will uh, sample data from the toy model, and then we will cluster this data uh, using all of the clustering methods uh, and then evaluate the clustering uh, with uh, the V-measure. And this will be repeated 50 times for each of these toy models. So we will have um, 50 data sets per toy model. So uh, if we start out pretty simple, um, we have a toy model with Gaussian clusters. Uh, and if we look to the left here, we see the free energy landscape. Uh, and we use this to sample data points. Um, and in the middle, uh, we see uh, one example of a sample data set together with uh, colored, uh, colored uh, 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 coloring according to the classes. And to the right, uh, we, see, um, we see the corresponding V measure. And uh, what we can see here is basically that all of these methods perform well on this type of data set, which is not surprising because it's uh, a data set full of uh, convex clusters uh, and Gaussian shaped clusters. Um, but what we can see is that Inflex and DMM um, actually perform a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> but so, okay, so uh, as, uh, as we have 
a real data set, we might not have exactly Gaussian shaped clusters, but we ha might have something that is close to Gaussian shaped or not uh, really at all. Um, so we decided to see how these um, methods perform if we introduce one cluster um, that is not shaped um, according to a Gaussian. So we have this uh, Saturnus shaped cluster. And um, what we see is uh, kind of interesting, and it's that uh, k-means and agglomerative ward and uh, the canonical Gaussian mixture model, um, they fail to cluster this. So basically what they do is that they divide uh, this one state into several clusters. Um, we see that the density-based methods uh, perform uh, better on this uh, data set. Uh, and specifically HDB scan and inflex uh, perform the best. But then uh, this doesn't look exactly like a free energy landscape that we would have um, in, uh, in, uh, from, uh, from our MD simulations. But uh, in reality, we would have something that is high dimensional and then we would project them down onto a few dimensions, uh, for example, using collective variables. Uh, and this would uh, lead to sort of poorly separated states. Um, we would have probably different densities of these states, and we might even have some nonlinearity uh, in the data. So for example, uh, in this third toy model, we try to mimic this situation. So we have, uh, if we look at the free energy landscape, we do have three uh, free energy minima, uh, but it's difficult uh, to see when we look at the scatter data uh, that we actually have three states because they're poorly separated. And uh, <coughs> so looking at uh, how well these methods perform, um, we see that the clustering are based on geom uh, geometric area. Uh, they fail to do uh, the clustering properly. Uh, and uh, it seems like it's a very difficult case overall, but Inflex uh, does uh, a reasonable uh, job at least. Uh, so um, what we can say is that uh, basically no clustering method is uh, perfect and can handle all types of data sets, um, but it seems like Inflex is able to handle uh, the type of data that we expect to get from MD simulations. We did prepare a Jupyter Notebook tutorial um, for this clustering, uh, and it's available on the Delmotz Lab uh, GitHub. So you can uh, go in there and uh, try this on your own data. Uh, we have uh, here adapted it to uh, CalModulin to show you how to do uh, the clustering. Uh, so the first thing that uh, we need to do is to import uh, free energy clustering. Uh, so this is uh, to allow us to do all the, these uh, things. Um, and uh, we call it the FEC with capital letters so that we don't have to write out everything. Uh, and so the first thing that we need to do before uh, actually starting the free energy estimation and the clustering is to uh, get our data on the correct shape. So this, uh, this is forces us to decide on uh, collective variables or how to describe the simulations. So in our case, we used two collective variables, uh, one called grid, uh, which very roughly speaking is like a contact-based version of RMSD, which measures uh, global conformational changes. Uh, and then we also use uh, another uh, metric, uh, another CV, which is called VDAC, uh, which we localize to the linker, and this measures the changes in secondary structure in the linker. Uh, so we have already processed um, our simulations, uh, so we have computed the CVs in each frame, um, and, uh, and this is what we're loading here, the text files with the first grid CV and then the text file with the BDAC CV. And uh, the data that we 
use as input to our function has to have the form number of samples times the number of dimensions. And number of samples corresponds to the number of, tra uh, number of frames in your trajectory. And number of dimensions uh, corresponds to the number of collective variables. So in our case, we have number of frames times two, because we have two CVs. And uh, so we, we construct this matrix uh, and we next, in, next, uh, in the next step um, construct uh, an object uh, by writing FEC.free energy clustering. And then we use this uh, matrix as input. So um, <clears throat> we need to specify the minimum number of components and the maximum number of components um, to, uh, to do the density estimation of the Gaussians, uh, of the Gaussian mixture. Uh, and then, so this is uh, all that we need to specify. Uh, but then if we're interested in looking at the free energy landscape, um, we want to specify also the temperature that was used when we ran the simulation. Uh, and for visualizing uh, the free energy landscape, we might also want to determine the resolution uh, of the visualization. So this is set by n grids, uh, and we set n grids equals to 100. Since we have two dimensions, we will get a grid that is 100 by 100. Uh, I will, in this uh, example, show you how to do the clustering uh, using this grid. Um, but of course, you don't have to do it on the grid. You can do it on the data. <clears throat> and then um, the end splits um, is to determine what type of model selection you do to uh, choose the number of components. Uh, so you can use, if you set end splits equal to one, uh, then you use the BIC criterion. If you set it to a number larger than one, then you will use uh, cross-validation uh, with uh, by dividing your data into parts and as many parts as n splits. Uh, so if you run this cell, um, then basically you will get this type of output uh, where you will have a list of the parameters uh, or the input arguments that you have uh, the, uh, that you have uh, uh, defined uh, and uh, those that were set to default values. So in the in the Jupyter notebook tutorial, we also have um, these uh, input arguments and a short description uh, of uh, what they do and what they mean. Uh, so you can uh, go in there and read for yourself. Uh, so the next step is to estimate the free energy landscape. And this is uh, done by just writing fec.landscape. And uh, what, so this will identify um, a model to use. It will estimate the density and then get the free energy from this. And it will return the coordinates of the grid. So this will be uh, kept in chords. It will also give back the free energy estimate uh, of each coordinate on the grid, and then also the free energy of each of the data points uh, that you used as input. So these are the free energy in each of, uh, of the frame that we have. <clears throat> so before we move on to the clustering, uh, we might want to look at the free energy landscape, and we can do this by uh, writing fbc.visualize uh, and if we don't use any input arguments here uh, we will get just a basic visualization um, but there are some uh, keywords that we can set uh, to change um, change the figure a little bit um, so for example in this case uh, we will uh, not show our original data um, as a projection on top of the landscape um, and we will change the X label and Y label to BDAC and GRID, uh, so the name of our uh, CVs. And then uh, we will also change the title to Free Energy Landscape. Um, so this is what pops out uh, if we run this. So great, uh, we have a Free Energy Landscape uh, of our simulations. Uh, and what we can see is that this Free Energy Landscape looks pretty complex. 
So uh, we would like to decipher this free energy landscape. And this is uh, where we start extracting the core states. Uh, so extracting the core states is done by uh, calling this cluster function. So we write fec.cluster. Uh, and in the first input argument, we uh, use the coordinates of uh, the coordinates that we use for extracting um, the the regions of uh, metastable core states. So uh, we could, for example, supply data as input here, um, but we're using the grid coordinates in this case because we have a high resolution grid. And then uh, uh, we need to supply the free energy of each frame uh, and then also our um, data that the data that we want to cluster uh, so this will be uh, the data of uh, our collective variables this will return um, the cluster labels and also the cluster centers and um, as i mentioned when we uh, compared this method to uh, the other clustering methods, um, we used a full clustering. Um, so in case uh, you would like to do that, uh, there's a keyword argument called assign transition points. By default, this is uh, false, but if you want to get the full clustering, you can change this to true. Um, and then this will uh, compute the second uh, derivatives it will construct the connected components and then uh, label the data points. And then if we run the fec.visualize again, uh, we will get um, what's seen here on the right panel. Uh, and then just comparing this to the free energy landscape to the left, uh, we see that basically where we have free energy minima, this is also where we extract uh, core states. Uh, so it seems to work pretty well. So in, in the next uh, step, uh, we thought that we would just see if we could understand something um, from this uh, results. So um, we identified the most common state, which was this uh, cyan state. And it uh, has this uh, helical linker. It looks uh, very Calmodulin-like. Um, and then uh, we found a really interesting state, uh, this yellow state, which is compact and uh, collapsed. Um, and it's over here in the landscape. And then we asked ourselves, uh, what would be one possible pathway in this landscape from uh, the most common state to this uh, strange collapsed state? And uh, what we saw is that one possible pathway goes through blue and then green before it goes to, to uh, yellow. And uh, when we analyzed the states, we saw that um, this pathway was uh, driven by uh, electrostatic interactions uh, by forming and breaking salt bridges uh, in the linker, uh, resulting in this collapse state uh, where, uh, where there's a network of uh, salt bridges stabilizing it. Okay. That was uh, an example of how to use this on biological data. Uh, so what we would like you guys to remember from this presentation is that uh, clustering is a data-driven way to extract uh, states from MD simulations. And uh, all clustering methods have uh, different properties and limitations uh, that are due to the assumptions that are made when, when you construct them. But uh, inflex um, is uh, is a is a method that uh, is good, is uh, well adapted to identify well defined core states, uh, and these core states will uh, be at uh, free energy minima. And then we went through this Jupyter notebook tutorial uh, for how to use inflex, and uh, you're welcome to try it out on your own data. So thank you for listening. Uh, and uh, let's start the question session. Thank you very much for the really, really interesting talk. Um, for everyone at home listening, if you want to ask questions, there is a questions tab in which you can um, 
put in whichever questions you want and we will get through all of the questions. Uh, in keeping with the theme of this talk, uh, the first uh, person to ask questions has asked what I will refer to as a cluster of questions. Uh, so um, do be ready for more than one question. And our first asker is uh, Shashank. Uh, Shashank, I've unmuted your uh, microphone. If you would like to ask your questions, please go right ahead. Mm, uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was a really nice talk. So my first question is on the clustering method. And explicitly, the question is on uh, spectral clustering. So uh, it's broadly on spectral clustering. Is this method uh, of spectral clustering based on uh, the principle of path entropy or maximum uh, caliber model? Um, no, so you can see spectral clustering as um, either a flow uh, or like a graph. Uh, like first you represent your data as a graph, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. then you can see this as uh, you have random walks on top of this graph uh, and the spectral clustering tries to identify um, regions of the graph where the random walk would stay for a longer time. Uh, oh, okay, 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 thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Shashank, would you like to ask your other questions? Oh yeah. Uh, so, so my second question is on inflex. Uh, it's I mean it looks like a very uh, nice method, uh, uh, but uh, the underlying like initially when like initially I understood like the underlying assumption in this method is we know the uh, underlying probability distribution of the free, of of our landscape, right? Like we should have that uh -huh. information before. Uh, well, so Inflex uses uh, the Gaussian mixture model um, density estimation to get that uh, free energy um, landscape or the density landscape. So basically, um, Gaussian mixture models are uh, pretty good at estimating densities um, because they estimate the density globally using all the data points uh, and they don't use these local uh, basis functions. And then also it's continuous, uh, so this makes it more stable uh, in the regions where you have, uh, uh, which are sparsely sampled. So then uh, we use uh, that together with the model selection, for example, cross-validation or the BIC criterion. Um, and then uh, we use the estimated density uh, to extract um, the core states. Uh, uh, if that answers. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I mean, so, so so my only confusion is, uh, uh, let's say we just have an uh, unbiased MD simulation. So we know mm -hmm. in unbiased MD simulation, we might not be able to sample the entire landscape or the phase space along the reaction coordinates. So then, mm -hmm. then the inform like still we can apply inflex uh, in, in that data set as well, but we might not get the, uh, we might not be able to extract out complete information about the system, right? Um, if, I can, if I can maybe yeah. add uh, something to what Annie was saying, um, I think what you're going into is uh, the choice of the collective variable. Uh, so I think uh, in the, the previous paper where we uh, talked about density estimation, we indeed showed that using Gaussian mixture models allows to reconstruct a free energy landscape in a, in a robust way. But the problem might be that you need to pick a set of collective variables to project the landscape on initially. And uh, that is a kind of a, a broad topic and uh, it's not always straightforward to determine one. But provided you have your uh, collective variable that you're confident in, or you could try a few, then you can uh, quite uh, with quite a few quite uh, with only a few parameters calculate the free energy landscape and then perform the clustering using inflex. So I'd say that the okay. biggest issue here might be picking the correct set of collect variables that separate states advantageously. Okay. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Um, the next question we have is from uh, Alexander Payne. 
Alexander, I've now unmuted your microphone. If you would like to ask your question, please feel free to do so. Hey, uh, I, I'm curious if you can use this um, Gaussian mixture model on um, a higher dimensional space, so like five collective variables instead of two, and then sort of related to that, you just mentioned this, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, have you looked at how the choice of your collective variable, you know, affects the, uh, the ability of influx to cluster the data effectively? And, you know, I guess related to that, can you just, um, oh, there you go. Uh, can you uh, use something like Tika and use a couple of the components from Tika to perform the clustering um, to minimize the um, decisions you have to make? Uh, so, yeah. Um... This method should work uh, basically regardless of the uh, CV that you use, um, uh, given that uh, you have something with a density um, that, that you can describe with uh, the with density. Uh, and indeed, uh, we did try this out on data sets with higher dimensions. So here we have four up to eight dimensions. And uh, we can see uh, that up to six dimensions, uh, or even to some extent uh, seven, we can do the clustering um, pretty well with inflex. But then you can't use uh, a grid to, um, but uh, but you could, uh, for example, use the uh, k-means to um, to pre-process the data and use the uh, centers or something to uh, to extract uh, the core states or just the data itself. Um, but if you have um, have enough data, then it should be possible. And also, we did uh, apply this to uh, Tika data, uh, not in this project, uh, but uh, in a different project. So uh, yes, you can use Tika. Awesome, thank you. Sure, thanks. Uh, great. The next question we have is from um, Eric Lang. Uh, Eric, your uh, mic is unmuted if you want to ask your question live. Uh, Eric, are you there? Uh, as Eric does not seem to be responding, I will ask the question on Eric's behalf. Uh, Eric points out that uh, on the GitHub page that you linked to, only the TOEI model tutorials are available, uh, mm -hmm. not the Cal Modulum. Uh, yeah. Would it be possible to access real case studies such as the Cal Modulin case and maybe have those added to your uh, GitHub page as well, please? Um, yeah, I mean, that could be possible. Uh, I think, though, I mean, the, um, as, um, as uh, you can see, like in, in, in this um, tutorial that we went through now is exactly the same as the tutorial that is up on the GitHub, so it doesn't really matter what data you use. I think uh, like you can use your own data and you can use the toy model data or this data. I think um, it, it doesn't bring too much to to put it there, but in principle we could. Great, thank you very much. Um, the next question we have is from Elvis Martis, who um, is not currently on this stream, so I will ask the question on his behalf again. Uh, Elvis asks, any specific things to keep in mind while deciding the minimum and maximum components? Um, oh, that's a good uh, question. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I, I think uh, uh, a good uh, way to do it is to start off by um, by choosing a quite large number of components or like a large range uh, and then do a sort of course uh, scan through this and then uh, once you've picked uh, once once you looked at the results if if you end up choosing models on either end point of this an interval uh, then you should uh, sort of move your range so for example if you pick between two and ten components and you end up choosing 10 components all the time, um, then, um, then you should probably ch move your range and then try five to 15. Um, and then if you start uh, choosing 15 components, um, then you can move it even further. But, 
but uh, basically you will see uh, how this uh, how the model selection if if it's within the range or if it's on the edge. Great, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, next, we have Simone Orioli, who also will not be able to say their question. Uh, and they ask, is this method comp compatible with data sets where each point is assigned with a different weight, uh, such as free energies obtained from metadynamics? Uh, yeah, that's also a good question. Um, so uh, we have done um, uh, an adjustment of this. So uh, as it is uh, described here, um, it's not, but we did uh, uh, add this to the uh, to the um, to the method, in, in, so it should be on GitHub. Uh, so let's see here, for example, we have we print out whether or not we use weighted data. Um, so then, in that case, um, the the data should be weighted, um, yeah, from, for example, metadynamics, and then. Um, uh, the the DMM um, density estimation will be done in a slightly different way uh, to uh, incorporate this, um, <clears throat> but it should be there. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Henry Whitler. Uh, Henry, I've unmuted your microphone. If you would like to ask your question, please go right. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, uh, I was wondering. Uh, I, I have a similar web page on uh, on GitHub. It's uh, with at molecular dynamics analysis of insulin. So I did a, a 1500 nanosecond simulation of uh, of insulin in one nanosecond steps. Uh, uh, so I was wondering because I did several simulations, and uh, in the second one I found two different kind of different large different. Uh, populated states, but, but I was just wondering if, if one can find, you know, maybe like minor uh, populated states, you know, like if there's, that one maybe want to quite cash with the eye, like if one, uh, if there's some kind of minor, uh, like, like a minor change or that one, they might, one may be able to use uh, Influx for, uh, for discovering like minor changes in a molecular dynamics tra trajectory. Uh, oh, that's uh, that is a good question. So that depends a little bit uh, on the data. If there is um, minor states, and if uh, uh, how well that those states are captured. Um, so basically, the density estimation will be performed. So we will select a model uh, so that we will try to not overfit uh, the data. Uh, but if there is data there that shows that there is um, a small state. So, for example, here we see uh, these kind of smaller states, um, mm. although they are high, uh, high density states, uh, they are kind of smaller um, and they might be difficult to see directly from, uh, from this. If you, if you just look at the data, you might think that, okay, so this is one state and then we have roughly maybe two states there. Um, mm. But indeed, we have uh, like several smaller states um, in this region. Um, so so, so only, you can try The only thing that we're remembering is that uh, this is based on having uh, minimas in the landscape. So if you have a completely flat region, you wouldn't see uh, the core state appear. It has to be a, 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 the population of that state has to be larger than the surrounding regions that would be transition states. Hmm. I see. Oh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, not, uh, uh, oh, hmm. yeah. Sorry. I can continue. I'll ask a question. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, if... Yeah, if... Yeah, and a second question also. And I, yeah, and if, if you if you complete, I can continue. Otherwise, yeah, 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 go ahead. Sure. Uh, um, so I was just wondering uh, with the license, uh, like, can, can I copy this code, code on GitHub and then adapt it uh, in any way I like, or like, uh, or uh, does it have any kind of license, or will it be applied in any BioXL software later on? Um, uh, so it doesn't have a license right now. Uh, maybe we should put like an MIT license on it. 
Um, but uh, I mean, like you can uh, film the repository and uh, uh, do stuff to the code, I think, um, mm. okay. to adapt it to. Um, but uh, yeah, like uh, don't uh, incorporate in in some software that you sell. <laughs> uh, <no, no. laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, so I have the same problem with uh, my repository, but I like to, to find the right one, but, but I like one have to just to try to find the best one, but, but yeah, it, uh, I have uh, the BSD free one for mine because it's, yeah, but it depends on, this, on, the, on the circumstances and everything. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, I'll read your paper so I can yeah, have a look. Yeah. In, right. in the interest of time and because we have a fair few questions to still get through, um, uh, I will now move on to the next question, if that is okay. Yes. Sure. Uh, so the next question we have is from uh, Bakari. Uh, Bakari, I've unmuted your mic microphone if you would like to ask your question. Uh, yes, so my question was about, uh, again, thank you for your talk. Uh, I wanted to know if you can assess your clustering. If, like, let's say you have some uh, label data or you don't have data at all, but you want to assess the clustering on, on your data? Mm, um, so this is a tricky question. Um, so this is um, clustering per se, I guess, is um, saying that you don't know what labels you have on your data and you try to figure that out. Uh, so in that case, it becomes difficult to um, assess whether you did a good clustering or not. Uh, but so, for example, on uh, uh, on this type of landscape, uh, if we would run some other clustering method, uh, we could see whether the clusters um, fall within the free energy minima or not. Uh, so that could be one way to say, did we do a, an OK clustering? Um, but um, if we look at uh, these toy models, for examples, um, so here we know the labels of the data and in that case uh, we quantify how well the clustering is done so uh, here zero means uh, that you know like nothing was correct uh, and one means that we had a perfect clustering uh, and then there are different ways to do this uh, and that uh, we just used the mean v measure because it seemed um, or it takes into account um, both the splitting of the original classes that you have, but also merging of classes. So you, you avoid both of those uh, cases. Um, does, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, great, the next question we have is from Ivan Pulido. Uh, Ivan, I've unmuted your microphone if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Thank you for the talk. I was uh, going to ask something about, uh, you said something uh, when you f were finding the pathway, you said that it goes from, uh, from the most stable structure to another. Is that shown by the clustering or is that like you know is, it is the most stable by the clustering or because you already know from uh you know from experiments or something like that and in that sense uh, can you can you use this data of clustering like to assess uh, structural models refinement with molecular dynamics uh so i can start by answering the first question um yeah. which is uh whether like how how do we know that this cluster corresponds to the most uh, likely state in this data set? Uh, and this has to do with the free energy landscape. Okay, yeah, I see it. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, it's uh, at the lowest free energy uh, minimum. Uh, or, but what what we do specifically to quantify this? Uh, I can see if I can find the picture here. Yes. So uh, what we do is uh, we have this density landscape uh, and then we integrate the density over the region of the core states uh, to get the probability of that 
uh, core state. So this gives us sort of state populations. And then here we can see that this state uh, pops up. Yeah. As being more populated. But you can also look at, um, uh, at the states um, and how many points you have in them. Uh, you know, how big are the clusters in, in number of points. Okay, yeah. Uh, so for your second question, um, can you repeat that? Yeah, so if you can, if you could use these clustering methods to, from a, for a simulation, um, for refinement, refinement of a structure uh, using molecular dynamics that, um, I mean, it's, it doesn't change much the conformation, hopefully, but you will still get, get some energy landscape. And I was thinking of using this method for it. Uh, so you're thinking of uh, just doing like plain MD on the structure, see how it relaxes and then picking the uh, cluster center to... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lucy, do you want to have, have something to... <laughs> yes, uh, I think... I think this has uh, to do with molecular dynamics itself rather than the analysis possibly. But of course, like Annie said, you can use uh, this clustering method to see uh, where the, what, what state is the most probable that I guess would be close to your input structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question we have is from uh, Cesar, uh, sorry, Cesar Mendoza Martinez. Uh, Cesar, I've unmuted your microphone. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question, please go right ahead. Uh, Cesar doesn't seem to be here at the moment, so I will ask the question for him. It's an easy one. Uh, which software do you use when running your simulations? <laughs> Gromax. Fair enough. Uh, the next question is more likely to be a set of questions uh, from uh, Arjun, who's asked a number of questions over this question session. So uh, Arjun, uh, your mic does not seem to be uh, unmutable, so I will ask them on your behalf. Uh, the first one is, um, if we have multiple runs of the same system, um, how can this be implemented? That seems like it's linked to exactly a time in the presentation. Um, next question is: uh, Can you use more than? Uh, can you use more uh, critical variables to help increase the sensitivity? And how would increasing the number of variables affect the sensitivity of your results? Yeah, so we, we answered that question earlier and he showed the graph showing that it's possible to cluster in high dimensionality up until uh, seven states, uh, seven dimensions. Uh, so I can add something to that. Um, and uh, I, I mean, we did touch upon that, but uh, if you want to add more dimensions, this means that you have to add uh, a lot of data or like you have to have a lot of data points to be able to carry out uh, the clustering and, and this goes for all the clustering methods actually uh, that are specifically those that are based on density so when you increase the dimensionality um, uh, you sort of uh, need more points to be able to estimate the density uh, and after a while you basically have no density because uh, the data is so sparse. So this is a point that uh, should be stressed. So just because you add uh, more dimensions to describe your data doesn't mean that um, you will get a better result per se. It's, uh, it's more important that you pick a few good uh, uh, CVs, for example. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that um, answer. Uh, the next question. Sorry, there are a lot of questions that have been asked that have been uh, that have been answered previously. Um, 
I think the next question uh, is going back to Eric Lang. Uh, Eric, I've unmuted your microphone if you want to ask the question yourself. Eric? Doesn't seem to be here. Um, specifically, uh, Eric is asking, um, on slide 45, uh, is the pathway shown here more likely than uh, the one going through several clusters at the bottom of the landscape? Or do, um, is that to do with, um, like, does your program choose the shortest pathway? Uh, yeah, that's a good question also. Um, so actually, this pathway, we just picked this by hand. Um, but um, you, can, you can get the shortest pathway. Um, but then, uh, of course, uh, that depends on what you use as your uh, sort of starting pathway. So it, if you would pick a straight line and then let that relax in the landscape, you will get something that is very similar to this. Um, but it doesn't make it more likely than this transition. So it's, uh, I don't know, uh, we don't really know which uh, pathway is more likely, I think. Um, so that's why we're also trying to say that it's one possible pathway. Um, uh, great, thank you very much. Um, that will be the final answer that uh, we'll be taking, considering that we're already running 15 minutes uh, over time. Uh, if anyone has any other questions that they desperately want to ask, uh, please ask them either on the BioXL page. Uh, these vid uh, this recording will become a YouTube video, which will make it to the BioXL YouTube page. Uh, feel free to ask the questions in the comments there. Um, and last, I wanted to very briefly talk about uh, future BioXL seminars which are coming up. Um, uh, namely, we have uh, a seminar in, uh, I think in two weeks' time, yeah, uh, on the 20th of May uh, by Brinda Vallet and Benjamin Webb. And the webinar will be about uh, PDB Dev, a prototype system for archiving integrative structures. And then we've also got a webinar coming up uh, in mid-June by Alexander Bovin uh, talking about uh, Haddock, uh, specifically the Haddock 2.4 server, new features and a guided demo. Uh, thank you again to uh, Lucy and Annie for the uh, very interesting talks and for answering so many questions. And thank you to everyone for uh, attending this presentation.